Hello everybody, I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm the organizer of Tech Field Day. The video you're about to watch is a recorded presentation of Intel's uh, storage group presenting at Storage Field Day 11. The uh, table is uh, filled with uh, invited delegates from around the world who focus on storage and storage related technologies. They are bloggers and podcasters and we've invited them here to participate in the discussion to ask the questions that you would ask while you're watching. If you'd like to learn more about storage uh, Field Day or Tech Field Day generally, just go to techfieldday.com. If you enjoy this video, go to our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash techfieldday, and you can subscribe and see literally thousands of other videos just like this one with all sorts of companies in storage, networking, wireless, and data center. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jonathan Stern, and I'm an applications engineer and essentially a storage solutions architect at Intel. And what that means really is that I work with a lot of customers, uh, from talented engineering teams to CTOs to help them solve the challenges or the problems that they're seeing. Now today I want to talk a little bit about this transition that's going on and some of the pieces that we have within Intel that we're compiling and presenting and offering to the industry at large to help grapple with one of the big challenges that, that we see. So first, let's, let's just run through the agenda. Uh, how many of you were at the last Storage Tech Field Day and heard about SPDK, the Storage Performance Development Kit? Anybody? Okay, one, two, three. That's great. That's huge. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the context that this project is going into, and then we'll go a little bit into the, the deep technical components of SPDK, not just from a high level, but from, you know, screwing the nuts and bolts together. Why are we doing what we're doing? Okay, so starting here. Now this is probably not news to anybody, but the entire landscape for storage is changing. It's in the midst of this tidal shift from the large traditional incumbent storage SAN vendors to both on, on the one side, the, the hyperscale storage de you know, deployments and these you know, hyperconverged or, or what, you know, and this is the chart is, is the enterprise server based SAN storage, right? So, so you can think of these um, radically disrupting the existing status quo. And this, this chart, you know, starts in 2012. Uh, we're here and that's just about to invert. So, so this, this big middle part is just about to get squeezed quite tightly. EMC said, you know, in 2016, hey, uh, this, is, this is when the all flash transition starts. And by 2020, pretty much everything is going to be, and from, a, from a production deployment st standpoint, is going to be flash based. That's their prediction. I think that's encouraging. When you ask customers what they think, right, this is uh, basically a, a storage market trend set of data that was collected last year. And what customers think, businesses, you know, small and, and enterprise, I'm sorry, mid-sized and enterprise-sized businesses, half of them are already there on, on solid state media. Half of them say, yeah, duh, we already see the value. Of the remaining half, basically 41% of that 50% are saying, yes, we want to get there. There's only 9% that say no or we don't know. What is this newfangled storage media? They don't, they don't have this on the radar, but, but basically everyone in the industry from a customer perspective is already looking at this transition. They're already planning their strategies. So that's large, big picture, what's going on. Now, this is actually why. Why is because there's business value, there's dollars and cents, there's revenue to be found in moving to this new media. So these are two things that Intel has collaborated on with customers. One of these is with Yahoo and their, their Flickr, you know, object store, photos or, or what have you. And this was actually something that uh, Mike is gonna maybe talk a little bit about. He's, he's sort of an expert on it, but this is something that Intel deployed where it's, it's called the cache acceleration software. And essentially you're deploying small amounts of very fast media to cache and greatly improve the performance. But the performance isn't really the whole story because there's two competing directions here. One direction is 
hey, let's, let's drive our quality of service up. Let's get these pictures served faster. But on the other side of that is the desire to reduce cost. And they were able to, to prove quite successfully that they were able to do both of those by adding in just a little bit of flash. And, and I mean like a really little bit. They did some work to characterize how much was the optimal for this particular workload. And the results were, were, were pretty great. The other one here is with a vSAN deployment and a large grocer that we're not allowed to say their name, but there's a basically software vSAN layer that they were able to deploy, the server-based or software-defined storage kind of model. And they were able to see huge, huge latency reductions because of flash media versus you know, rotating media, and a huge reduction in their data center footprint. And that was obviously a big win for them from a cost perspective as well. So these are what a couple customers are doing. But the, the key point that I want you to take away from this is both of those are software components that are enabling the performance of the media. It's not just the media magically being sprinkled like pixie dust into these environments and working. There is a software lift involved. So this is where the media landscape has been and is going. I think you, you all are probably well aware, but at one point, everything was a spinning disk and it was connected by some external controller, right? That's given way to NVMe, where you get rid of that external controller, you connect it directly to the PCI bus. And as our Intel and, and you know, perhaps larger industry roadmaps progress, that investment in moving to NVMe starts to pay huge dividends. And it sort of culminates, at least for Intel, with taking that next generation media, that 3D crosspoint media, and sticking it right in a dim slot, right as close as you can to the CPU. So you have this, again, storage class memory as the end goal of this long transition. Now looking at that a different way. Once upon a time, many years ago, hard disks ruled the land. And they had a huge, giant amount of media latency, rotational seek time. That meant that this little tiny sliver down here of protocol and software was effectively lost in the noise. It didn't really matter. You could spend a lot of time down there and your media was still the dominant factor in your workload. But as soon as you start down this path of, of low latency flash media, right, this obviously becomes a non-trivial part of your workload. So the first thing we as an industry did is we did NVMe, right? We took out this protocol and controller latency because it was no longer lost in the noise. It was actually a, a reasonable and appreciable percentage. So that got us here, right? So now we have these SSD that are directly connected to your PCI bus using NVMe. Uh, by the way, is anybody here not familiar with NVMe? OK, just making sure. Um, once we did that, Intel, as a, as a company, is, is in the process of getting to here with these incredibly low latency medias that use a completely different kind of, of, of technology internal. I can't talk a tremendous amount about that because what I'm really focused on is actually this little tiny green bar at the bottom. That's where my fight is. Because while that little tiny green bar didn't really matter until we got down here, that little tiny green bar is now, again, a non-trivial part of the workload that obscures the value of the media because of the driver stack. And this, by the way, is the absolute best case scenario that we're painting here. This is the software latency derived from the driver. So this is, again, the rosiest picture you could possibly paint is this is, you know, 30 or 50% overhead from the media, right? Worst case, it's hundreds or thousands of times more software latency than the media is capable of. So t talking through this from another direction, right? We, we, had, we had, you know, high latency, low IOPS with disk. SATA NAND got us to pretty good latency and a pretty good amount of IOPS. You know, a couple orders of magnitude, that's, that's impressive. 
NVMe arrived and we greatly increased the amount of parallelism that each device could do and we got a huge jump in IOPS. 4K random reads, let's just call that an IOP for, for argument's sake. And with Optane, right, those IOPS go up, that latency goes down, and the problem is that the software starts becoming the huge bottleneck. So the way to solve that is with some Intel software ingredients, stuff that we've been working on in the lab, trying to essentially take that little green bar and shrink it as much as possible. So that's where this storage performance development kit, SPDK, that's where this comes in. Now it's a storage reference architecture composed of a whole thing, a whole architecture end to end, and a bunch of little components that you can pull out for a specific challenge. Right now you can, for instance, if you're a startup, take this whole thing off the shelf and build out your differentiating value inside of it. Or if you're an existing you know, incumbent, you can take this and use one of the components, like say NVMe over fabrics, and pull that out and use it in your solution. So again, it's this reference architecture composed of a bunch of little blocks that do a bunch of little different things, and you can use them all together, or you can break them all apart. Now, we as Intel, uh, we're not selling this. This is absolutely free. Anyone can get it. Anyone can use it. You can use it on, I mean, I don't think you can use it on a MacBook because there's only one NVMe, but if you have more than one NVMe device, you could probably use it on, on any commodity system, right? Um, the key architectural elements of this, and, and by the way, is anyone here familiar with DSSD? So DSSD makes some high performance flash stuff. I was just at the, the storage developer forum and they gave a great presentation about their software stack, right, amongst, amongst other things. And I found an unbelievable number of similarities to the conclusions that they had reached in the software that they created and, and what we've created. Uh, the difference is that, um, well, we'll get into the differences. I'm not, I'm not slandering DSSD. We have some really exciting numbers that are perhaps even more impressive than, than DSSD's numbers, which are incredible. All right, the key points are user space, bypass the kernel. Kernel, uh, in, in, the, in the words of one of our architects, kernel's where all the bad stuff happens. Let's not go into the kernel. Let's keep it at user space. Lockless, no locks. Maximum scalability. So this is, this is crucial, crucial, crucial for how software can scale is, sorry, I'm getting my, wa my water, uh, is, is not having locks. Locks are friction. And friction is the enemy of high speed. The last is pull mode. So we bypass interrupts. We don't do interrupts. We don't like interrupts. Interrupts are effectively slow. Now, it didn't used to be this way. And when you have... 10 milliseconds to, to handle something, an interrupt is a tremendously low bar to cross. But when you have a few microseconds, waiting a few microseconds for an interrupt is actually a, a, a pretty substantial piece of overhead. So those are the pieces. And again, it's, it's all designed for that low, low minimum latency kind of, of hardware media. If you talk about any storage software stack, it breaks down into sort of roughly kind of squint your eyes and look at it four kind of categories, right? One is the hardware drivers right down at the bottom. How are you interacting with your media? Then there's this essentially services layer. What are you doing with the data? Are you replicating? Are you deduping? Are you rating? Are you compressing? What are you doing in terms of service and adding value, right? There's protocols. How do you get that out of box A to box B? And then, of course, there's, say, box B, the client side, something that's consuming the storage remotely over a network. So we have a little bit of innovation in all of these places, and I will talk through as much of it as I have time for. But if something is really interesting, please stop me, ask questions. We'll, we'll talk through it, and, and, and we can get to the rest of it later. So, at the bottom level, we have something called quick data technology, which is uh, 
a marketing phrase for something called Crystal Beach DMA, which is a DMA engine that's built into the Xeon platforms. Now, a DMA engine lets you offload the movement of data, right? The other thing that we have is this NVMe driver. And NVMe, obviously, is something that you normally expect to be using from basically the kernel, right? You're, you're talking to your hardware through the kernel, through system call or something. We don't do that in SPDK at all. We unbind it from the kernel when we start up and we basically bind the queues, the hardware queues to our user space driver. And from then on, you're directly accessing that media without going into the kernel, okay? Same is true of this, this Crystal Beach DMA or this, this quick data driver. Built on top of that, initially, is this NVMe over Fabrics target. Now, when we very first released this, and that's why it's shown this way, when we very first released this, this was, I've got my drive locally, I wanna export it over the network. All it does is export the raw drive. So here's my NVMe drive, and here is its doppelganger on the network, and you can map to it and, and use it as if it were directly attached if you connect to this NVMe over Fabrics target. Okay. We've added a lot since that point. So this is what is currently up and downloadable right now. And what this is, is we've, we've paired this NVMe over Fabrics thing with iSCSI because well, NVMe over Fabrics is dead sexy and everyone's hot for it, right? <laughs> <coughs> iSCSI is well established. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, gave, I gave Steve a hot flash. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so iSCSI is well established. And there's lots and lots and lots of immediate use cases where you can drop in an iSCSI target that performs really, really well. And people can actually start seeing value quite quickly. So we did that. But to do that, we actually had to build this giant green blob. <laughs> so this giant green blob is a block device abstraction because SCSI and NVMe are not the same. And there is, fortunately, a whole spec that, that shows how you map these two things together. But to do that effectively, to also be able to go to things like this Crystal Beach DMA or to AIO, you have to have some sort of, if you will, generic abstraction of what you do with a block device and what the protocol is asking. So we built that layer and we connected it up to both our SCSI and our NVMe protocols. So this little dongle inside, this extension, this API for you to extend, this is where if you took this whole architecture off the shelf, you could immediately start, start building out your value, build a RAID layer, build uh, a deduplication layer, build some compression engine for real-time compression, right? This is the set of APIs that allow you to hook in to the existing event framework that powers all of the rest of this and start building out value. We, we put that in place. We don't, us as Intel, don't have anything there, but we talked to a number of customers that are using that and giving us their feedback. Okay, so this is what exists in SPDK right now. Why, why do we do this pull mode driver thing? Why bother, right? So first I want to <coughs> tell you about the features because the features are pretty compelling. We do all of the latest spec compliant NVMe stuff in the driver, right? We do this all in this asynchronous pulled mode operation. So what that means is you want to do an IO, right? You're, you're an application. That's what you do. You do IOs. You come down to me and you say, hey, here is my read request. I say, great, cool. I'm going to go do that and, and I'm going to call you back on this function callback when I'm done, right? You go off and you, and you do your thing, and instead of, instead of me, the, the device driver, just calling you back when I'm done, I, I actually, what happens is you come to me and say, hey, are you done yet? Did, did you finish? I was off doing some other stuff. I came back. Did, did you finish that yet? It's, it's maybe a different model of how you interact with your media than, than most people are used to. Most people are used to the, the media saying, hey, I'm done. Interrupt. Uh, come, come service me, right? This doesn't work that way. And so from, uh, from essentially a threading model perspective, 
this can pose challenges. But actually, if you look at the tech industry, if you look at how people build their software at the enterprise level, a lot of infrastructures, a lot of software architectures are composed this way. <clears throat> now, we also, for NVMe, put up all of the sort of very useful spec compliant features that the media is now capable of. Now, these things are largely to enable what might be considered enterprise kinds of use cases for NVMe. So end-to-end -end data protection is kind of a, it's a big deal for enterprises because you really, really don't want your bits to flip without mm -hmm. detecting them at any point for any reason, right? So that's one. Scatter gather, right? That essentially allows <clears throat> the device to DMA from a wildly disaggregated list of pointers in memory. So if you are, say, an iSCSI device, and you receive packets that are 1,500 bytes long, right? That 1,500 bytes doesn't map super well to like a 4K write. So what you have is these disaggregated in memory. They're not, they're not necessarily contiguous in memory. And so you can't just automatically assume that you can DMA that very cleanly. So scatter gather functionality enables you to DMA scattered around chunks of memory pretty easily, right? Reservations is crucial for dual port. You have to be able to say, hey, I'm gonna write to this block. Don't, don't you, the other port, write to that block. I'm gonna write to that. That's necessary, right? Namespace management, same deal. It's really, really handy to be able to have multiple namespaces per device when you're using it in an enterprise format. And this weighted round robin is basically quality of service. Now, why do we do all this enterprise software enabling? So Intel released our dual ported NVMe drives, right? These are very useful for existing enterprise class architectures. So you think of all flash arrays, you think pure EMC, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a whole gamut of architectures that use dual ported devices now because with SAS or with um, you know, similar technologies, right? That's, that's pretty easy for them to consume. They have a dual ported SAS adapter and that SAS adapter handles all the wiring and easy. With NVMe, you're directly accessing it. So you need the device itself to have two ports, right? And they need infrastructure around that to be able to, to, to use it, software and, and hardware. Those are the, the obvious, the obvious pieces are to support the existing enterprise class customers. But we as Intel have a pretty darn robust roadmap for these dual ported devices, and there are less obvious reasons why. First is these emerging JBOD models, which do weird things. Uh, so there was one that I was recently using that you could connect 24 NVMe to six redundant servers. So it's kind of splitting the difference between scaling up and scaling out. You can stick in a you know, rack local kind of model, you can stick 24 NVMe devices and connect six servers doing different things to the you know, pool of storage. I think the most maybe far-reaching or, or subtle but profound is that because of NVMe density and what we can do with NAND media in terms of scaling along the lines of Moore's law, density becomes again a huge challenge that you have to deal with because of the, the basically the blast radius of dense storage. So right now, you know, you take, you take a, a rack full of, you know, a rack full of spinning disks and you can get to a petabyte or two, maybe whatever. There is line of sight to a petabyte or two per U. Per U using flash media. So be because of that, that density greatly expands the blast radius if you lose one of those U's. And it makes it very, very compelling to have a good, robust dual port roadmap. Because, again, you're, you're trying to limit the scale of an outage by making sure that that one or two or three petabytes doesn't go offline. It doesn't fall away, at least not completely. Okay. So we, as Intel, 
We support in our hardware all of these use cases that we, we talked about from the software side. Basically, the, the software does this stuff. The hardware does this stuff. We, we see the value here because of where we see the, sort of the media going, right? That's not the only stuff we do. Obviously, we have a lot of single port drives that do a lot of very, very good things. But the dual port drives are something that we co committed to and have a roadmap for for, for good reason. Jonathan, what does uh, namespace refer to in the NVMe ah, context? So kind of think about it like a partition, but it's like a hardware partition. So when you address, when you address the drive, when you say, I'm going to do a read or a write, you are doing a read or a write to a namespace, not, not to the whole controller necessarily, but to a namespace. So what does that map to into something that somebody might manage? Is it, is it a volume, a segment of the volume? Uh, it's not a it would be thing. it would be like the equivalent of maybe like a SCSI volume or LUN. Right. So so volume is a better word than LUN. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. so does that yeah. answer the question? Yeah. 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 So the namespace, so so currently oops. Currently all the namespaces on on, on normal drives are there's one namespace per drive. But that is not a that's not a limitation of the spec. That's, that's something that, that's an implementation choice of existing drives. Now, stuff like this, this, this new drive, this dual port hardware, essentially supports you to have multiple namespaces. So think about multiple different you know, uh, yeah, VMs it using it. You'll, you'll probably want to have multiples, so. Exactly. So where does this come back to the software? Right, so, so the software, again, was the bottleneck. Now. We are trying to build those pieces from the hardware driver level up for people to get rid of that latency. So this is a comparison between you know, roughly the Linux kernel's level of performance and SPDK's level of performance on, on one core. And why do we target the Linux kernel? Because they are the reference, right? That is the de facto standard of, of performance. But if you're building a, a, an architecture and you're in an environment, a VM or uh, some environment like an appliance where you don't really need a lot of the additional protections that the kernel gives, you can trade those protections for a ton of performance and efficiency. So in, in this case, again, this is one core. What, what you can do with one core, you can do 3.6 or so million 4K random IOs per second with one core. Now, if you scribble the numbers on the back of an envelope, you can see that, that you know, roughly you can do about 5 million I, you know, 4K IOs per second with all of the PCI E lanes. Um, so I guess that'd be half of the PCI E lanes on a single CPU. So we're already facing essentially scalability challenges with SBDK of testing how far this goes. This is one core with two cores. I don't think we can connect up enough media to fully max it out, at least not yet. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a performance statement. The benefit, though, of, of, this, of this is really the efficiency that it buys you. It's, it's great and, and fine and all to be able to do a hojillion IOPS, but what does that buy you? Well, that buys you a bunch of cores back to do value-adding things, you know, things like your dedupe layer, right? If you, instead of using seven or eight cores to do your IO workload, you can do one core. You just bought yourself six or seven cores to do dedupe or to do compression or whatever value-adding that you want to do. Right. Again, the side effect is also latency. Right. So we started this by talking about that little green bar and that software latency. When you only take, in this case, two or 300 nanoseconds from a driver perspective versus five microseconds from a driver perspective, you've bought yourself a tremendous amount of latency with respect to that media. So look at that a different way. One I.O. Submits, completes, right? There's interrupts in here, there's submission queues, there's a ton of 
depth that you dive down into through the Linux kernel. I think we, we measured it at something like 170 functions that are called and invoked on the Linux kernel path. And again, all of those functions are doing something useful in a general computing perspective. They're not just there for no reason. But if you're not in a general computing context, if you are doing a storage specific appliance or piece of software, how many of those add value? How much of this five microseconds of latency is value add to your application? Right, so for SPDK, we essentially sort of throw all that out. And we say, okay, let's, let's start with a, a blank slate. What pieces do we absolutely need to do to get an I.O. done? And we, we talk about a lot of this sort of mapping the existing kernel sources of overhead to the SPDK approach to bypass or minimize those sources of overhead. Any questions about this? Yeah, so does this reflect real benchmark or test numbers, or is this theoretical? This correct? reflects real measured benchmark numbers. Now, the kernel can do a lot of different things. So uh, at SDC, we were comparing notes with uh, Christoph, um, uh, who has done really intriguing things with, you know, sp specifically with doing poll mode kind of behaviors in the kernel. And now the kernel can get very close to these latency numbers. The one thing that we haven't touched on, though, is that the kernel doesn't work for everyone. Not because of its technical capabilities, but because of its license. If you're building proprietary storage stuff and you really want good performance, you have to either stay all above or all below the kernel. The expensive part is the interactions between user space and kernel space as you're building an application. So the application space is usually up here. It makes system calls down into the kernel, and those are expensive. If you can manage to build your whole application in the kernel, it can go really fast and do pretty amazing things. But if you're trying to sell that software, the GPL says that if you make modifications and build your data path in the kernel, you open source that, you upstream that, you, you <coughs> offer that for download. SPDK is BSD licensed, which means in practice there are no restrictions on commercialization, right? And we do that primarily because we do operate in user space. We are not beholden to the GPL. So for people that are building these as proprietary software kinds of stacks, that's crucial. Purpose right, it's, it is, it's purpose built. So really quick, how do you, how do you talk about stuff, you know, we've, we've talked about this, this lower level. How do you talk about the upper levels of this? Because we've, we've taken the same architecture that we use down at the media and brought it all the way up through the entire stack, right, out of the box. Just got a little bit mangled by PowerPoint, but, but up here you see there's uh, a little pipper, and that says 32. And, and this one down here says 21. That's the number of cores that it takes to do roughly line rate on, in this case, about a 100 gig part. So 100 gigabit per second part. Using either software, uh, software TCP, software iSCSI in, in the Linux LIO, SCSI target, iSCSI target, or the SPDK iSCSI target. Now the reason that this is good is, is this is actually roughly twice, almost twice as efficient on a per core basis <clears throat> to do a faintly ridiculous amount of IO. You know, in, in this case, SCSI consumes, you know, iSCSI 21 cores worth of compute to do almost 3 million IOs per second or you know, you know, roughly in the ballpark of 100 gig in that neighborhood, okay? We get all of the same architectural elements working for us doing this, but this is actually using the kernel TCP IP stack, which is challenging. 70% of the cycles that the SPDK stack is spending are in that kernel TCP IP stack. So hypothetically, wouldn't it be great if there were a user space TCP IP stack 
that we could use and not have, again, that very expensive interaction with the kernel. Gee whiz, it sure would. I, I, I wish we could say I knew what the solution for that was. I, I, I don't. We have some pieces. We have some proof of concepts. But we don't have anything that we can share. And we certainly don't have anything that we've, we've used. But again, this really points to that, that crucial element, right? That doing iSCSI is scalable, but it's, it's computationally expensive, right? What about NVMe over fabrics? So NVMe over fabrics is, like I said, dead sexy. Everyone's, everyone's after it, but, but why? 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 So for anyone that doesn't know, NVMe, you come out your PCI bus, you talk NVMe protocol, and you're at the media, right? NVMe over fabrics is essentially the same thing. You come out your PCI bus, you, you wrap your NVMe commands in this NVMe over fabrics capsule, and you punt it out over your network. And this fabric can be anything, but, but typically it's an RDMA Ethernet network, right? You punt it out, out of your network, and you land somewhere on your storage, right? That's the simplest possible view of what NVMe over fabrics does. It puts this in the place of this. And that actually has some really intriguing consequences. So for us, the, I, those iSCSI numbers were, were very high. This is just on a single core basis with SPDK. You can do over a million, 1.2, 1.3 IOs per second using NVMe over fabrics. Now, if you, if you run the numbers back on, on that, that also means that you're doing all of those IOs, you know, a million IOs per second, you're, you're, you're doing all of those IOs through the network with latencies that are very short. So what we've measured is somewhere in the neighborhood of, of a 10 microsecond overhead, 10 to 15 ballpark overhead of doing these operations over the network. Now, when your media is, say, like traditional NAND, roughly 80 to 100 microseconds, that 15% overhead of doing it over the network, that might not be so bad for the things in your stack that get enabled by doing this. And we'll, we'll, we'll expand on that. The key, though, is, you know, again, comparing the Linux kernel as, as this sort of standard reference, this is ridiculously efficient because, again, it builds on that efficiency of the driver. It throws overboard all those interactions. It basically exposes all the performance of the media that it can. I want to talk really quickly about what we're doing next, though, because the next piece is where it goes from being just for people who build storage appliances and things that look like storage appliances to being much more accessible to other deployment models. So the first one is an NVMe over fabrics initiator. Now, why, why would you do that? Right? That seems silly. So you have, again, at the client layer, you have something interacting with your storage. And typically, again, you'd be interacting with that storage from a kernel call down in the weeds of the kernel. You want to you send it out over the wire. However, if you have an initiator, Right, that has these same properties, you can bake it into things like a hypervisor. And when you do that, you can enable essentially applications, VMs, containers, whatever, that's, that are running in that hypervisor to have the same exact API, the same interface to local or remote NVMe media. It's, it's the same API whether you're talking locally or remote. Now, I don't know if that's true for everything, but it's true for SPDK. And if you, again, if you build this in, you're bypassing the kernel interactions. You're able to connect remotely or locally. You can migrate those containers. You can, you know, oh, uh, we're going to take this one down for service. Just move it over here. Oh, the mapping exists. Right. You can do all of that. And essentially use the same API, you don't have to change your software. So from a practical implementation yep. standpoint, you know, something where people 
kind of grasp what they're going to use it for. Yeah. One of the let's think about hyperconverged infrastructure for a second. Sure. As I'm here, as I'm hearing about an initiator built into the hypervisor, or your application, either or an application. Right. It starts at you know one of the big discussions around hyperconverged is what the stuff that has to be done remotely. Mm -hmm. you, as soon as you go over the wire, right, you take a huge latency hit. It sounds like this could basically put this on. Well, not be a huge, but a latency hit. Any latency right. hit, right? Um, it sounds like implemented correctly with the development kit, you can basically eliminate a lot of that issue. Yeah, and that's the idea. Hyperconversion on steroids sort of thing. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Cool. Okay, I want to make sure I'm understanding yeah, we're, exactly we're, what you're saying. So again, this is we're 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 deep down in the guts of, of stuff that people have to build. This isn't necessarily something that you can go shrink wrap turnkey get, but for I already people did like, it. No, I'm just kidding. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is a really nice laptop, I would believe you. <laughs> Hacker typer typing the code out. Um, so anyway, that's uh, it's, it's, we're building the ingredients for people to bake in this kind of functionality. We're not trying to bake in this kind of functionality, right. but we're building the ingredients there for people to do it, right? The second is, we have that block diagram, that big, big green blob with that beautiful acronym BDAL, that block device abstraction. When you combine the ability to use NVMe over fabrics, either locally, you know, as, as NVMe direct protocol or <coughs> remotely, uh, you can have that NVMe over fabrics piece actually talk to your hard disks through AIO, so we have backend drivers for that. You can do, you can talk to your, your RAM, like your DRAM over NVMe over fabrics. You can talk to other stuff over NVMe over fabrics if you, if you wrap it in the right protocol. Now, I don't know necessarily why you would do that, but the other key component here is because now you have, both, you have software on both sides of the wire, right? All of it's freely licensed. You can change that protocol to suit your selves. You don't have to do strict spec compliant NVMe over fabrics. You can add your own, say, metadata layer, right, to NVMe over fabrics because it's not under GPL. Now, of course, now as soon as you go non spec compliant, you're not going to interop with anything besides yourself. But for people who are building applications, hyper converged clusters, right, that's not a huge problem. <coughs> Last piece is, you know, as I said, we have some challenges building systems big enough to, to continue scaling performance testing. We're going to keep trying because I think it behooves us as Intel to, to find the limits of what you can do with our architecture from a storage context. Now, that's all the time that I have. There's some other interesting things on our roadmap uh, I'd love to talk to you guys about. So this blob store piece, say if you're building a database and you don't need all the things that a normal file system does, you could use that. I'll have to skip a lot of that. But there's another piece, which is vHost SCSI. So if you are KVM and you want to bring a bunch of virtual machines and plunk them on top of SPDK, so you want all the efficiency of interacting with your drives, you don't want to have to pay the kernel cost. Wouldn't it be great if there was a layer that you could connect to in your, say, QEM KVM environment that plumbed down through SPDK with all the latency and efficiency advantages. We're working on that too. So that's what we're working on. I'm out of time. Uh, I appreciate the questions. Any other questions that you guys have, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I'll be here.